everybody, and welcome to a conversation with a number of folks here about uh, the lessons that we've learned implementing observability. Um, I would like to invite on stage uh, seven other folks from this conference. Come on up. Hello. What a wonderful group of people. Thank you all for coming here to have a conversation about uh, the, the scars we've gained on this road to observability and how we can help others learn from our challenges. Uh, I want to start with just a quick round of introductions. Uh, you've all uh, given talks here, and so a number of people have seen those talks, but a number of folks haven't. So uh, if you could just start off with uh, a quick introduction to uh, yourself, your title, your company, we'll go around the room and then get right into some of these stories. Uh, Frank, how about you start for us? Oh, sure then. Hey, I'm Frank Chen. My pronouns are he, his, and I'm an engineer at Slack. Glenn, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Glenn, uh, he, him. I am. Uh, I was a software engineer at CircleCI, uh, although I've recently started a new job. Uh, go, John. Hi, um, I'm John Casey. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I work at Red Hat. Um, Kind of involved. I'm a principal software engineer involved in the uh, the the build pipeline for our products. Hi everyone, uh, Michael Erickson. Uh, pronouns are he him. Um, Zoom waiver since last June. Um, I work as a site reliability engineer at Intelligent Medical Objects. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Pierre Vincent. Um, he, him, and I'm uh, head of SRE at a company called Glowfox, where we build uh, software for fitness industry. Cool. Hi everyone. My name is Anato. He, him. Uh, I work at HelloFresh as global VP of engineering. Lovely. Uh, thank you all. Um, well, let's just get right into it. Our goal today is to give the gift of hindsight to other people in your roles uh, and understand a bit about how we can walk this road to observability. Uh, Frank, will you kick us off? Tell us, please, what is one thing or pain point about Honeycomb or about observability that you and your team have learned the hard way? And one thing that you wish you had known sooner? Yeah. Um, hey, folks. Uh, Complex interfaces are like really complex. It's I think Honeycomb is a really great power tool and requires some tinkering and some bootstrapping of ideas of what the explorable space is. Like one way to tell when someone's eyes glaze over when I bring up the query interface and my soul dies a little bit. Um, the observability metaphor I've been using is like imagine finding a needle in a haystack. Before, you might need to redeploy the world to be able to know what a needle looks like. But today, your haste stack tells you what isn't hay, what doesn't belong. Um, and just so, like, what works is, like, make it super easy to get started. Motivate folk with their specific business problem. Um, like, one way to find and drive adoption is smaller group explorations and demos of a specific problem that a group is trying to solve in another context. And pair with folks and observe and trace around and see what you find out. I think. Uh, we've had a lot of help with Slack's observability info team to build interfaces into Slack trace, which outputs to both Honeycomb and a few other um, real-time and analytic stores. And that has been yeah, super helpful for us to help solve problems at Slack. Cheers. Yeah, that, that feeling when you bring up the blank query builder, uh, even, even after using this thing for five years, I still feel like uh, what do I do? Um, I, so I, I appreciate you calling that out. Um, Glenn, can you, can you, uh, uh, do you have suggestions and ideas on, on how to help people, uh, overcome that hump or, or a story of your own? Um, well, so I was thinking about the prompt for this talk and it was like, okay, what's the, what's the biggest thing to avoid? And I was like, I don't think I can do that justice in like two or three minutes. So I thought more about paper cuts, like what are the paper cuts that I can tell people to avoid? Uh, and so the one that sprung to mind was like field naming. And um, there was a talk to a little bit about this in an earlier talk today where like 
basically every honeycomb like data set has like 16 names for every field uh because depending on which app you looked at uh, i think there's like i think i feel like this is a little minor product gap in honeycomb like if i could just make a derived field that like replace them all and coalesce them into one that'd be great um but yeah so i think trying to keep a handle on that early on like especially the really important things that are common things throughout your whole system like just get a wiki page write them down and tell people to go there first when they're looking for a name like don't make don't make it difficult but make it so that people can add to that list and reference everyone else's list really quickly uh, so yeah so that would be my main thing like just try and get on top of your field naming early and have like a data dictionary but don't make it a gatekeeping bottleneck well, you know that the problem with having 16 field names that are all the same thing is you can put a derived column and have a 17th too <laughs> I, I love that. Uh, I make it don't make it difficult, um, uh, Renato. I, I feel like you can pick up that thread pretty easily. Yeah, exactly. So I think um, there's one thing I wish we knew um, when we started this journey, which is the size of the challenge that we were taking on when we decided to embrace observability. And don't get me wrong, I definitely don't regret that decision. What I mean is, by knowing in advance, we the team would be able to be a little bit more prepared and probably take some different strategic decisions. And I think. Uh, uh, tackling, for example, uh, the, the, the different um, names for the same uh, data point is, is definitely one of these things. So I, I would personally break down the challenge in two parts, the, the technical challenges and the social technical ones, which is a term that uh, Charity likes a lot. On the technical side, I think we, we got held back by things like the lack of uh, maturity on the available libraries, for example, um, open tracing, open census, open telemetry. And here, I believe it was just an unfortunate timing. We started our journey at the same time that these uh, libraries were merging, so um, we had a little bit of extra work there. And the engineers that were that we served from the platform team ended up getting mixed messages from us. So we started pushing them to use Open Census, and then at some point we had to ask them to start using Open Telemetry, which in hindsight might not have been the best decision, given Hotel was uh, a little bit too early stage, and we could probably have kept using Open Census uh, for a little longer just to, again, reduce the cognitive load on, on people, right? And uh, another technical problem we only identified uh, later on was the amount of wiring we needed to do from the platform side to make sure that the traces were propagated through all of the different hops, that we could get data from uh, load balancers, CDNs. This kind of proved to be bigger tasks than we uh, anticipated from the, from the platform team. Now to the social technical challenges, uh, they were quite interesting as well. And I believe uh, timing also played a key role here. So we weren't expecting 300 people to immediately jump in when we said observability, other things, but we also didn't expect such a low engagement. So thing is, we didn't really consider the cognitive load uh, that people were already dealing with. So when we started pushing forward adoption, people were busy working on other stuff and we were ju just dumping them an extra Jira task. Right, so this kind of approach creates frustration on both sides, on the developers because they have platform people and SREs bugging them all the time, and on us because people are not engaging with our innovations. So I think uh, knowing about these things in advance would, uh, wouldn't have changed our decision, but we could have avoided some bumps here and there. I'd like to, to, to react on, on that side of things for the social, social technical part. Like I've been in different places, different companies where we've tried to like in the SRA side of things to, to really like push people to understand production better because I suppose like as SREs in that side we're like we have massive amount of curiosity it's like we see something that spikes we see something that sticks out it's like okay look I'm going to spend the next hour on this because like it's going to bug me if I don't know what it is and it's kind of hard to sometimes understand that other engineers just don't feel that way and um, in, in, in some ways that's where the so what you were saying of like dumping them Jira's of, okay, no, you, you go and instrument your service. And that without the context, I feel it, most of the time it just is, is bound to fail because well, they have their backlogs and yeah. it, it just feels like you're kind of pestering with more stuff. What was one thing that seemed to have worked a little bit better is just to try and have that stuff kind of organically seep in by just kind of, I guess, was try to get that curiosity um, mindset going for everybody about, hey, so there's some weird stuff happening in your production environments all the time. And like, it's actually a bit of a treasure hunt sometimes to just find what, what you're going on. And like showing after the fact, 
some kind of weird incident and just going, we've done that like a five minute loom video or something of, hey, do you know what? There was this weird thing and this is how we figured it out with Honeycomb. This is how we figured it out. This is how we found that needle in that haystack. Um, that I find that's, that's just a pretty cool way to just go and say, oh, do you know what? There was, it's kind of a game, right? And you, you can get that benefit in your own services by going and instrumenting them. And rather than just making it, hey, here's another task that you got to do, but here is, you know, how this stuff can become more and more interesting. And then as we go, it's like, oh, I want that. Like, I want that for my services, right? Um, and like, like, but I still wish everybody had some of their curiosity that, um, that I see SRE is having. I think that really resonates um, both those points from Pierre and Renato with my experience as well. Um, when I'm talking with our engineering teams about sort of the value of observability, the value of curiosity in their production environment, sort of one of the feedback things I get from them is like, okay, we're, we've added a story into our backlog, um, make application observable. And right, that's a pretty big hurdle to get over. It's okay to start smaller. Um, maybe find what is that application endpoint that's most critical to your business. Maybe it's um, performance issues that you're having a hard time sussing out. You can start much smaller than the whole thing needs to be observable. You just sort of need a hook into the system. And then I think your engineers start to sort of progress on that trajectory on their own, especially as you're providing them tools that um, facilitate that learning curve. So I'll just chime in. I love the idea of doing a treasure hunt. Um, I mean, almost making it a competition to see who can come up with the most kind of arcane <laughs> set of cascading impacts or whatever, you know, just like, here's the thing that I found and giving people time to do that would be fantastic. I love the idea of um, you don't have to have the entire thing done to get benefit. I mean, kind of the story of what we're doing is we're starting in one place and we're trying to build our way out. And, the more you're able to cultivate that curiosity. And that takes time. You're like, you have to give people space and time to have curiosity because that time pressure kills curiosity. Um, but the more you're able to, to do that, then you wind up running up against blank walls. And there's nothing worse than chasing a problem and running into a blank wall and you see it disappear. You have to go and build the next stage so that you can see what's going on a little farther out. Um, honestly, that's pretty good description of kind of how we've progressed. So I actually have a fun story about treasure hunt. So um, I remember, I think it was about two years ago, a little bit more when we um, we were supposed to have a call with Michael from Honeycomb to demo the platform with us. We had just dumped uh, um, our, our production logs into the system and we had an incident five minutes prior to the call or 30 minutes prior to the call. And the incident was going on and platform people were called. And uh, I was uh, one minute away from telling Michael to postpone the call because we were in the middle of an incident. And then someone said, why don't we ask him to help us find the, find the issue? So he actually did it. Five minutes after the call uh, started, we were able to pinpoint the issue being due to some auto retries that were connecting a monolith uh, code base to a database. And we couldn't see this from any of our other dashboards. We had the hundreds of other dashboards. We were looking into RDS. We were looking into the applications and things seemed fine, but there was a very tricky locking uh, issue that we just couldn't pinpoint elsewhere. And five minutes into the call, he was able to help us out. So that was the, 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 the buy-in that we needed for, for signing the contract, let's say. That is a great demo. Yeah. Yeah, I love this idea of the, the curiosity and, uh, mindset and, and making little videos. Uh, you know, here's what you can have too. If, if only you add some instrumentation, here, here you go. I think SLOs are a game changer as well. Uh, this, this gets people really excited to like uh, try and cover an end-to-end an, an -end user journey with, uh, with tracing and get SLO as a bonus. I'm curious for the other panelists, have you sort of seen observability in your org um, as a more like bottom up, like grassroots type of initiative? 
um, effort, or have you sort of had more of a top-down mandate to move towards observability? I've been trying to sort of pick up the threads of who's done it what way, um, and I'm curious how it's functioned in um, each of your organizations. We've definitely been sort of bottom bottom up grassroots. So I, I wanted to pick this one because um, we actually kind of did both uh, in a really weird way. Well, not in a weird way, in a kind of good way. So basically what happened was that myself and a couple of other engineers, well, actually our first foray into Honeycomb was something was broken and I just signed up on the free tier and threw some data at it and got an answer. I was like, oh, this is great. Um, boom. Uh, but yeah, and then so we, we picked like a couple of applications at the edge that people who were interested in Honeycomb and had an application they wanted to see stuff from just sort of grabbed an SDK and started wiring stuff in to see what it looked like. And that got success and we started talking to people. But then we had this like internal tooling team that uh, apart from like, part of the platform uh, organization at Circle. Uh, and they sort of said, oh yeah, this is going really well. Okay, we will then now like co build a standard library that will be used across all the applications. We'll deploy a collector, we'll deploy and manage refinery. And they sort of took over the, the, um, the tracing aspect of things. Uh, and then we're responsible for getting that into other teams' applications, coaching them and sort of owning that experience. So yeah, very much it started a little here and then it kind of jumped here and then it came back into the middle again. So yeah, kind of all of the above really. I would say that on our side, it's been kind of both. Um, the observability, the, really dr the drive to be able to really see what's going on in production is mostly born out of a need to be responsive to our stakeholders, you know, to our users. Um, but and so I guess you could say that we started kind of in the grassroots and, and in a, just in a pocket of the, the company. Um, but now there's a lot of interest in kind of holding the organizations themselves, you know, inside the company to kind of standards about reliability and, and responsive to things like that. And so we're getting a little bit more kind of management level interest in what are the numbers that we're putting up you know, kind of the SLO numbers sort of. And so it's, we're in this experience of kind of starting to meet in the middle, uh, building toward each other, I guess. Yeah, and I'd love to speak um, to a similar experience as Renato um, at Slack. And I shared a little bit of this story um, in my talk a few hours ago we implemented our first cross-service trace in the middle of the second day of a multi-day incident involving Git LFS that was strangely affecting a small portion of the fleet that had cascading, of course, cascading um, failure scenarios for other portions of our infra. Because in, um, like, I work in developer productivity and build tools where a lot of the events um, when they're either lost or have some sort of issue are absolutely critical. Um, and that story, right, um, and I, I feel like this uh, should hopefully like strike a, a, a good like chord for all of y'all, like stories have this like good way of sharing some like really hard concepts um, really easily. And with that single cross service trace, I think two hours later, our um, incident was over. And during the talk, I did, hadn't realized this yet, but a few days er, just before this multi-day, multi-team incident, we had kind of like the same problem. Um, and so this was like incident two, day two, um, multi-team incident. And so that was, um, I think really helped um, build, um, a lot of interest in how other teams inside of Slack could adopt tracing and yeah, use um, this tool. I love this varied collection uh, that are, are all reflections of, um, you know, comp complicated, the, the work we do is complicated. Uh, it's thick. There are a lot of different pieces. Um, uh, Renato, you mentioned you know paving the easy path. Uh, Pierre, you mentioned the little videos. Uh, Frank, uh, telling stories to as a way of communicating these. Um, I, I feel like there, there's this this collection of uh, methods for uh, reducing cognitive load or or communicating these complicated bits. Um, I would love to hear of some other. Uh, tools that you've used for that on on as you're bringing observability to your teams um, 
Storytelling has been really key for us. Um, I think it is, like Frank said, it's a really powerful tool. Um, and especially if you can connect some of those stories, um, almost like an essay, right? The thesis statement for an essay. In this essay, I will. It doesn't quite have to be that reductive, but then tie that value from observability to things that matter in your organization, whether they're objective and key results or recent incidents that um, where did, things didn't go as planned and observability would help out. Um, organizational values, right? Connect that to your business. Um, and I think those stories can really help maybe folks who weren't at the sharp edge of that production issue to start to understand um, how this might fit into how they ship software going forward. Yeah, I think like there's a common theme I hear in pretty much everyone's Honeycomb adoption is that it's not someone's like adopting Honeycomb or observability tooling because they heard it was cool. Uh, it's because they're blind and they want to see. Uh, it's like they want to achieve something. They want to un like they want to really get into their systems. Um, and I think once then you've got a few people at that company who are starting to get into it and starting to experience it. The trick is then finding ways to bring everyone else along for the journey. So a common example is like if you've got an incident process that isn't chat based, like you all just jump in a Zoom. Like I've been at companies that have a really chat based incident process and I love it. And then after like half an hour or so, someone's like, should we start a Zoom? And then you just get crickets in the chat and you're like, well, what's going on? I can't tell anymore because it's it's gone into this video. And, and I think being able to see that flow of chat coming past with the honeycomb queries in it and then refer back to that later and like that sort of thing where you see, oh, well, I can see how as they were investigating that incident, they were dropping queries mid uh, like all over the place and I could see the development of the query over time. And yeah, you can pull that back out from the honeycomb query history, but being able to see it alongside the discussion in the chat and someone going, oh, what about this? What about this? Um, I think that's a really powerful, like, just if you join it, if you're new at a company, like, and you're not involved in incident management, just go and watch the next incident. Like, just sit along, see what's happening. You learn so much so quickly from that. So I think this uh, whole idea of storytelling goes hand in hand with product thinking as well. Um, I think uh, the SRE space has a lot of opportunities for applying product thinking as a technique. Uh, in our platform team, we, we, we always try to hypothesize about the problem we, we might want to solve, right? And then you have to confirm that the hypothesis is valid and then you can calculate, like, is this really worth solving? Um, a very good example is like MTTR. If you look at the MTTR as one of your DORA or Accelerate metrics and you see that it's super high, like maybe we can actually do some math here to justify the, the, the investment needed on, on making this better. Because if we reduce MTTR by 30%, we can save X amount of money on a daily basis or on a monthly basis. So this kind of stuff also really helps create some engagement. And, and it also helps create empathy with the product owners of the organization, right? Because there is always this trade-off between building new features and running the system in production. But not always the POs are necessarily aware of the cost of running things in production or the cost of actually not running things in production. So um, I think product thinking is a really good technique that I like to use a lot on, on when it comes to platform topics. So this is maybe a bit of a divergence from that, but just keying off this idea of, you know, expensive running things in production. Um, this is something that I've, I feel keenly. Um, we started out our path, you know, hosting our own. And at Red Hat, we have a lot of expertise just kind of laying around. If you get in touch with the right people, you can learn to do a lot of things. Um, I think that may have led us to a bit of a false sense of security in terms of what we could do for ourselves in terms of doing support. Um, so, you know, we were using an internal aggregated log because we had another team that was already doing some of this kind of stuff. And the problem is that we didn't really spend enough time thinking about whether they were actually doing that in a way that's going to be highly reliable. And so as a result, we were trying to do production support with tools that themselves were not like production capable. They weren't production reliable, if you will. And, you know, we have people in Europe who can't do queries on Kibana because the latency is too high, things like that. Um, it confuses things because it, it, you end up sending mixed messages about how you actually do production support, um, you know, and, and you don't really know what you can rely on and things like that. And so it makes things a much harder 
you know, incident response becomes much harder. But it also has me thinking about kind of the recursive nature of reliability, you know, in, in the tooling you use to deliver things, the tooling you use to support things and that kind of thing. If I had thought about that up front, um, you know, what happens when your aggregated log solution or your metric solution isn't there? Because guess what? You're doing incident response over here and you're also running that thing and that's just fallen over. Um, it makes the buy versus build question a much more clear thing, I think. That sort of story reminds me of kind of like the early days of like uh, public cloud adoption. So you imagine like someone's got their infrastructure team, they've got the data center team, like you need servers, you go talk to the data center team uh, and they're like, okay, can I have some servers? They're like, come back in three months. And you're like, okay, well, I've got a credit card and I can just go to AWS now. And like in like 10 years ago, this was like groundbreaking, right? This, and now this is like, we consider that normal. Um, but that applies to basically every vendor. Like if you're, if you are forced to use your internal team's tooling, then their incentives are probably not going to align with the things you need from them. Like Honeycomb is out there trying to grow the market, like in, expand their um, market share and build a better product. And whereas maybe your internal team does, isn't interested in those things, maybe they have different goals. And I think being, a, if you're able to choose, uh, then A, you can choose a vendor and B, your internal team might be more motivated to say, actually, no, we're going to make it worthwhile for you to choose us. Uh, I, I think it's probably down also to the fact that the log aggregation stuff has been I suppose out there for quite a long time so like everybody has been running elastic shares for quite a long time so it's like well why would we need to do anything else right like why would you need to you know send up a big check for honeycomb or for like the next crowd if you know we sure we have elastic search here it's you know without the context i think that's that just gets lost like in like in glowfox we don't have the the, the scale of, of of slack or, or red hat like in our sre team is like is three people right like that's so um like those choices of will I run one extra thing instead of going to the vendor is super, super critical. So it's like, well, okay, I want to do my feature flags. I'm going to go to vendor X. I want to do my observability. I'm going to go to Honeycomb. And like the, from like from the, I suppose, like when you look at the balance sheet, it's like, well, this is costing that much. But yeah, um, running Elasticsearch, which is probably going to fall over whenever, when you actually need it, um, and then you'd be like, okay, now I also need to manage this on top of actually responding to the problem, as, as you said, John, that that's like, this is recipe for a disaster because like you're, and then the minute you lose the trust of people in the tools that you give them, that's, it's gone, it's gone. It's like, oh, you're, I, I'm not going to go to Kibana because the last time I went there, like half the stuff that I wanted wasn't there, or it was loads of duplicates or like, okay, I'm picking on elk, but look, whatever you run on-prem, right? Um, that's uh, so like, and, and I think we've probably seen that uh, multiple times over. Yeah, you kind of feel like you've got this kind of, you know, space age technology to help you do production support, but at the end of the day, you're still stuck with sharpened sticks because <laughs> things start to fall over. Regular expressions are a very sharp stick. <laughs> We talked a little bit about it pain points um, with adopting Honeycomb and then also sort of this build versus buy with internal tooling. I think one of the things, especially for folks who might not be familiar with Honeycomb, their free tier is super generous. We were solving a lot of our initial questions on that free tier before we even had to consider leveling up. Um, so I, I really recommend sort of, if you're interested, like definitely try that out. Um, we solved a lot of interesting production issues on the free tier um, before we moved up. And to double down on that, like you don't even really have to go and like, I mean, you can go get open telemetry and get some beelines and wire up or whatever. But if you have like a log system where you're like, I've got all this data and I just can't see, I can't explore it very well, export some logs, get Honeytail, throw them into Honeycomb and, you know, find out what it's like to actually be able to search your logs properly. Uh, well, we are just about at time for this session. Um, thank you both for those wonderful plugs. <laughs> really, this has been a, a real pleasure. Um, it's it's fascinating to me to to hear different stories of of how Honeycomb has worked its way into all of your organizations, uh, and the the easy parts and the difficult parts uh, along the way. Um, and I'm I'm really excited to uh, to keep going on this road and and see what comes next.
so uh, this wraps up our panel. Um, uh, there's going to be a little bit more conversation on this stage, uh, reflecting on the conference, uh, and um, then uh, I think some some workshops after. The agenda's up there. Thank you all very much. It's been a real pleasure. Talk to you later.